thanking Meta Moldova for both inviting me and for everything you're doing for the local teachers in Moldova. Uh, I know it's been a really difficult year for everybody. And, you know, I mean, as someone here myself who, who kind of struggled to, to move to this kind of online reality and who, who misses seeing three-dimensional people massively because, you know, my, my main contact with people these days is a kind of two-dimensional screen. Um, I know it's been a really tough year for lots of people. And so I think it's great that you have things like the Meta Moldova Conference to bring people together, even if only digitally. So welcome. As you can see, what I'm going to be talking about is kind of teaching speaking online. And I should begin really with a, a kind of little bit of background to this, which is up until about a year ago, I basically was doing little bits of teaching online. I had a few private students, but most of what I was doing was offline. Um, I did a London summer school every year face to face. Um, I did quite a lot of like local teaching in centres around where I live. Um, I did some teacher training abroad, all that kind of thing. And when the pandemic hit, I suddenly sort of panicked and realised like we need to be working online or we're not going to survive. And so I kind of set up a small online school, um, mostly working in the end with non-native speaker teachers of English. OK, um, crazy people who already spoke very good English but were motivated to learn even better English. So, you know, in some ways we're very lucky because we have these kind of perfect, super motivated, crazy students. But a lot of what I'm doing is working on student speaking. And it's something as a writer, as a trainer, as a teacher, I've always been interested in is thinking about how we can help people speak better online and offline in a way. And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about comes from that experience of pivoting or changing to this kind of online world. But I think actually it's probably worth thinking about general principles for teaching speaking anywhere before we talk about online. And I think the first thing to say is you get better at speaking, not just by speaking. OK. If all you're doing is practicing saying what you know already, you just go round and round and round in circles. In the end, the way you get better at speaking, of course it must involve practice, but it also must involve, first and foremost, I think, learning more language. So, you know, when you have those students who are like, teacher, how can I speak better? So, like, well, you've got to do the hard work and learn more language. I also think that from a teaching point of view, all the speaking that students do in the classroom, whether it's in first language or second language, actually, and I'll talk about this a bit more later, should be seen as a chance for us to provide feedback on things that students don't know. So we should be listening to the students and using their speaking as a chance to teach them something new. I think when we look at what kind of speaking we're asking students to do in class, some kind of speaking is much more motivating than other kinds. So if students are speaking to get better at dealing with everyday life, you know, helping them buy tickets, uh, deal with problems, book flights, book into hotels, uh, you know, just kind of everyday life stuff. If you're helping them to talk about their thoughts, feelings, their experiences, their opinions, their ideas. If you're helping them to think about and engage with and understand other cultures, other ways of thinking, other places in the world. I think all of those kinds of speaking are generally more motivating. And I think what's often less motivating for students is when the speaking is just in class to practice form manipulation, where it's only speaking because you're practicing a piece of grammar 
and it's not really personally meaningful and it's quite controlled and quite restricted and quite free, uh, quite li limited. And I think the better students get, the more important it is that speaking isn't just form manipulation, that there's some kind of personal involvement and some kind of freedom involved in the speaking. So when you then think about what students need in class, okay, online and offline, I think the first thing is, if you're going to get better at speaking, you need the chance to speak. And students don't always get this in language classrooms. I mean, I've been in classrooms myself as a language student where there was very, very little chance to speak. It was like teacher speaks, students sit there and say, you know, like that basically. We didn't make any mistakes, but that's only because we didn't have the chance to speak at all. You then need some kind of interesting, engaging things to talk about, to get stuck into. You need some degree of freedom within the tasks where you're not just repeating things that the teacher has told you to repeat, but you're trying to maybe express something beyond that, to go beyond what's been given to you already. Probably you need some kind of time to prepare, maybe before class, maybe in class, maybe both. You probably need a little bit of support to help you get to where you want to be. You need the material and or the teacher to show you, you know, this is how you can build up to where you're good at this task. You need some kind of model, maybe again in the material, maybe from the teacher to show you, look, this is how to do what I'm going to ask you to do. When you're doing the speaking, you probably need a little bit of assistance. You need some help. After you finish, and maybe during as well, you need some feedback. You need to be told, this is what you did that was great. Here's how you can get better next time you're doing something similar. You probably at some point need the chance to try again. Um, for me, the one language I learned well was Indonesian because I, I used to live in Indonesia in the 90s and I had the chance to have the same conversations endlessly because people would ask me the same questions over and over again you know where are you from what are you doing here why did you come here do you like it what religion are you what football team do you support what do you think of our food you know this kind of questions and over time, I had those same conversations again and again and again. And I got really confident at managing those kind of basics and built on that. And you probably need some kind of links. And this is where I think working online and the digital realm helps us. Some kind of links to further learning to get better at talking about the things you've been trying to talk about. So even if you're doing one to nine in a physical classroom, number 10 is probably something that you send as an email or a WhatsApp chat, maybe with links to YouTube videos or you know, voice recordings or whatever. So number 10 is almost always going to be technologically mediated in some way. So if you're trying to ensure engagement, I think you need to be looking at the tasks, okay? And, you know, some of you may make your own material. Some of you may be forced to use particular kinds of material because you're working in the state system and you, you know, this is the book you will be using, yes boss. Some of you may choose the material that you're, you're using. And I think it's important to think about how the material helps students get better to speak. And often I think the material itself doesn't engage the students enough, or, and it can be and or, the preparation that we do as teachers for the speaking doesn't help students. Sometimes in course books, there are too few questions. You know, there's just, Two questions that you expect to get 10 minutes of speaking from. Good luck with that. It's probably not going to happen. Sometimes the problem is the questions are just yes, no questions. 
even questions where you think this is going to be motivating, like, you know, have you ever, have you ever been to Bucharest? Have you ever been to Odessa? Have you ever been to London? Have you ever been to Berlin? You might be thinking students will talk about their experiences. Well, in an ideal world, yes. A lot of the time what students do is just say, yes, yes, no, yes, no. You, same, finished. You're like, oh, that, that took you five seconds, you know. No! <laughs> and even if you think they're yes, no questions which might go further, they won't necessarily because some students just don't like taking risks because they're scared of making mistakes. Some tasks, I think, don't work because they're too obvious. So when you put students together and you give them a picture, describe what's in the picture. Well, the students just sit there and say, you can see it. I know. It's there. I know. There is a man playing the guitar. I know. You know, those kind of tasks are, are a bit weird, really. Sometimes students can't do tasks because they don't have the life experience. They don't have the cultural knowledge to answer questions. I can remember working in Indonesia in the 90s using Headway. And one of the questions in Headway Intermediate was, what reasons do you think there are for the collapse of communism? And I was teaching 17 year olds in Indonesia who were like, what? So I just just discussed the question in the book. We've no idea. We don't understand anything about this question. So, you know, in those situations, it's like you don't have the world knowledge or the cultural knowledge. Some questions, I think, require too much imagination. You know, in pairs, tell a ghost story. But we work in a bank. Why do you think we can do this? Yeah. Or they require too much spontaneity. You know, in pairs, role play a conversation between an angry teenager and a parent. So I've no idea what kind of conversations angry teenagers and parents have. OK, how do you expect me to do this like this? Sometimes students just don't see the point because it doesn't connect to their lives, their experiences, their opinions. So I think what you might need to do is sometimes you might need to write extra questions. You might need to encourage students to talk not just about themselves, but about people they know. So often, instead of saying, have you ever, sometimes a better question is, do you know anybody who has? OK, because then even if the answer is, well, not me, but a friend of mine, actually. And especially with negative language, like if you're teaching something like get fired or be kicked out of. If I ask you, have you ever been fired? Have you ever been kicked out of somewhere? What kind of person do you think I am? If I ask you, do you know anyone who's ever been fired? Do you know anyone who's ever been kicked out of a place? Yeah, well, somebody, not me, okay, but somebody I know who isn't me once got fired from their job for punching the boss, not me, okay? And you're like, right, so someone that definitely wasn't you, that could be, but definitely wasn't you, got fired for punching the boss, okay. Maybe sometimes just explaining the purpose of the task helps as well, where you say, okay, I'm going to get you to have this conversation because this will help you be better at talking about your travel experiences, because this will help you, uh, you know, share your ideas about politics with other young people that you meet when you're traveling. When you've got low level students, one thing you can do is get them to rehearse, to do the conversation first in L1, okay? And say, okay, I know this is difficult. First, try and have the conversation in your own first language. As you're listening, you can be writing down some language that they might need. So you can say, okay, I heard some great ideas. Let's look at some of the things you were saying and how to say them in English. Here are 10 sentences based on what I heard. You can even prepare that before because you can guess my students will probably say something like this 
I can give them this afterwards or show them on the computer afterwards. Here are 10 things you said in Moldovan and here's how to say them in English. Now you're going to do the conversation again, using all your great ideas, using some of this language, try it again in English, you can do it. Maybe you need to encourage students to take notes, to look up words they want to try to use in a dictionary, to think in their first language and ask you, sorry, teacher, how do you say blah, 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 blah in English? You guys, I mean, most of you, you're going to be bilingual teachers working with students who share your first language. I mean, this is a superpower that you have. If I was working where you are tomorrow, I wouldn't have this ability. So, you know, you've got this ability, you can use this in the class. And I think then it's always important that after the speaking, you teach something new based on the student speaking. So the students think, I'm not just speaking because the teacher's looking for mistakes. I'm not just speaking to practice. When I'm speaking, my teacher is listening to me and teaching me new things that I can say next time. Wow, that's what I'm paying for. I think another thing to think about is just getting in the habit yourself of predicting what you think students might say, okay? Yeah. I think students often benefit from seeing or hearing what we as teachers would say when we were doing a particular task. And, you know, maybe hearing or seeing what we imagine they might want to say as they're doing it. And when you're looking at speaking tasks, if you think about how you would answer those questions yourself, it helps you decide if it's a good task or not. Because when you're predicting, you sometimes think, oh, this task will be great. It will generate a lot of language. What would I say? Oh, actually, I've no idea what I would say. That's a rubbish task. What was I thinking? You might be thinking this task will help students practice the second conditional, the past perfect. Try and do it yourself. Record yourself, maybe. Did you use that grammar? Sometimes you do it and you think, oh, it's a great task, but actually it doesn't practice the grammar. You know, you might decide that doesn't matter. You might decide, okay, we're going to do this task. If you can use the second conditional, great, but don't worry about it if you can't, just try to get your meanings across. Sometimes when you do the task, you realize, wow, there's a lot to say here, but uh, I haven't taught all of this language. So I need to think about how to get some of this language to my students, okay? What you might then want to do is to think about, well, here's a list of language that might be useful. Maybe when I'm emailing the task to my students before the class, I can send them, you know, um, I'm going to ask you to do this speaking task in class next week. Here are 10 sentences or 10 bits of vocabulary you might try to use, okay? Choose three that you want to use in your own speaking. You might want to either record yourself doing your own version of the task or just do it in class. Um, sometimes what I do with my students is I'll send them a task, like, you know, I'm gonna ask you to talk about this topic in class. Think about what you want to say. Here are 10 sentences you might try to use. Here's a one minute video of me giving my answer, okay? And when I'm giving my answer, I try to use some of the language that I think they might want to use. And, you know, I use my voice to draw attention to some of that language. So it might be in class, you're going to talk about five friends of yours, how you know them, why you like them, and, you know, what you do together. So I might send a video saying, yeah, so here's a picture of one of my oldest friends, Dan. We go way back. We've known each other since we were 16. We first met at a gig, at a concert in London. And when we got to know each other, 
we realized we loved the same kind of music. OK, and use some of the language that I might want them to use. When you're thinking about this language, when the students are preparing in class, if you're saying you've got two minutes to think about what you're going to say, you're going to be better able to help them. If they ask you, how do you say blah, 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 blah in English? Ah, I'm glad you asked me. Here's how you say it in English. And the students look at you like, wow, you know everything. And you think, ah, I just guessed that this was what you would try to say. And I looked it up myself before the class, but you don't know that. Also, when the students are actually speaking, if you've predicted in advance what they might try to say, you will be better able to correct them. OK, so I'll just give you one example. Um, we did a class recently with our, our lexical lab classes where we were talking about kind of pregnancy, childbirth and parenting. OK, that was the kind of topic for, for, for the day. And we sent out some tasks beforehand. And this was the warmer. Do you know anyone who's pregnant at the moment or who's recently had a baby? Now, of course, the answer might just be no. OK, so in the actual session on Zoom, you put them in breakout rooms, maybe three or four people in each group. Most of my students were women in their 20s and 30s. So, you know, most of them will know someone who's got a kid somewhere. What I then did was to think about what kind of language might be useful if you're going to discuss these questions. And when you're doing that, it's not just single words. It's not just thinking about grammar structures. It's thinking about phrases or sentences. So I sat there and thought, what would I say? What might language might I use? OK, can I make a list of this and send it to my students? So what I sent in the end was this. You might want to use some language like this. One of my friends is eight months pregnant at the moment. She's due. The due date is sometime next month, sometime in June, sometime in July. They'd been trying for ages and she'd started to think they just couldn't have kids. She hasn't had a scan yet. They don't know if it is a boy or a girl. Strange use of it for lots of students. It was quite a difficult birth. She was in labour for 18 hours. She had to have a C-section in the end. When's it due? Do they know what it is yet? How's she feeling about it all? How was the birth? How big was the baby? And when I then heard the students talking in class, you can see them sometimes going, yeah, my daughter actually uh, had a baby last month. Um, she was in labour for 12 hours. It was quite a difficult birth. So they're kind of recycling some of that and changing some of that because I've predicted some of that language in advance and sent it to them. If you wanted to, you could also just record yourself saying it and send it as a sound file, you know, very easy to do now on phones. What it also means is thinking about your own model as a teacher. And maybe some teachers don't like modeling things because you think, oh, teacher talking time. I've been told it's bad. I've been told I should do more student talking time. Well, that's a lovely idea. But sometimes a little bit more teacher talking time gets a lot more student talking time. And sometimes if you don't do any teacher talking time, you don't get any student talking time. And obviously, some things are easier to model than others. If you're answering questions or you're commenting on statements or you're telling a story or you're producing a kind of longer stretch of speech, it's easy to do that because it's not a conversation. You can provide a kind of monologue model. And I think giving your own model is really useful because you're making it clear to students how you want them to answer. You know, you're showing them this isn't just a yes, no exercise. Um, if it's something like, have you ever been to? You might say, OK, for me, the first question, have you ever been to Bucharest? I have actually. I've been three or four times, I think. The first time I went was back in 2002. 
and you tell a whole story about it and you, you give them some examples. So then when the students are doing it, they know, ah, not just yes, no, ah, you want a story, oh, okay, I've got stories. It also kind of makes the purpose of the task clear. So if you want them to use some grammar in their own examples, use that grammar yourself in the model. Um, if you want them to use some vocabulary that you've been looking at, use some of that vocabulary yourself in the model. If you've predicted some things that you think students might want to say but maybe don't know, you can feed that language in indirectly through your own example. I think also your teacher talking time gives the students thinking time and breathing time. If I came into class and said, OK, I'm going to put you in breakout rooms now to talk about a bad journey. Off you go. You kind of go, right, OK, um, wow, we're in a breakout room already. Bad journeys. Um, 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 after you. No, no, after you. Um, bad journeys. Um, if I say in three minutes, I'm going to put you in breakout rooms, you're going to be talking about bad journeys. For example, for me, have I ever told you about what happened when I flew with Aeroflot from Jakarta in Indonesia to London in 1994? No, never. Let me tell you. And I then tell my story. Crazy story. Uh, yeah, I'm glad I survived that journey. And while I'm telling this story, the students are kind of thinking, oh, yeah, something like that once happened to me. So it gives them a little bit of time to kind of remember and, you know, it sparks memories off. I think also it shows that you're a human being. OK, <laughs> sometimes students forget that teachers are also human beings and that you have lives and that you've done interesting things. I mean, I can remember when I was at school once, the first time I went to a pub when I was about 17, I saw my geography teacher in the pub with a, with a woman. And I can't remember what I was more shocked by, the fact that my geography teacher was in the pub or the fact that my geography teacher knew a woman. Um, and I think I was shocked because nothing my geography teacher ever did in our geography classes encouraged us to think about the geography teacher as a human being. They were basically just the person that forced us to use the geography book. They never told us any stories. We knew nothing about their lives. We had no sense of them as a human being, basically. They were just the person that bored us about geography. If you share your own stories and your own experiences, students kind of go, wow, the teacher's really interesting. Thank you for that story. I've got a story too. And you create this kind of culture of, you know, sharing stories and experiences and ideas and opinions. So again, this is something I did recently. This was a, a revision activity. All of the language in bold was language from the last class. And we began with a kind of, okay, I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms. You're gonna talk about these questions, personal questions, using the vocabulary in bold. First, pick one that you'd like me to answer, okay? And letting the students pick the question is always good because they always pick the difficult one, okay? They always pick the personally embarrassing one. Uh, and when you're giving your answer, you can think about language that they might need. So you might kind of go, right, number one, what's kept me going? What's kept me sane through lockdown? It's a good question because probably like most of you, I found lockdown really hard to deal with. I've often felt isolated. I've missed seeing people. I didn't like being stuck at home all the time. And one of the things that kept me sane was getting out of the house every now and then and going for a walk in the woods. Another thing that kept me going was music. Just finding time in my day 
every day to sit and listen to some music. Okay, and as I'm doing that, I'm kind of feeding in things that might be useful for you, giving you ideas, giving you breathing space, uh, and kind of, you know, showing that, hey, I've been through what you've been through. I know how it feels. And then you'll get more from the students as a result. Another thing that you can do, and this may sound like a strange thing to tell teachers, is you can cheat. OK, you might be thinking, I'm a teacher, I can't possibly cheat. Well, sometimes teaching is very useful. If you think that one of the main purposes of speaking activities is to give us as teachers the chance to teach new language or to kind of teach new ways of using language that students half know. OK, that's great. Ideally, in the classroom, you provide some feedback based on things you hear students say. But that can be really difficult to do, especially actually online, where, you know, say you've got 20 students in a class and you put them in, what, 10 breakout rooms, seven breakout rooms, and the task takes seven minutes. That means you've got one minute to go to each breakout room, listen to them, check they're doing the task, find something from each group that you want to focus on as feedback and write it down, that's really difficult to do. Even in a physical classroom, it's difficult because you get distracted. Sometimes students don't make any mistakes or just say things fine. You're thinking, I need to find something to write on the board to look at afterwards. I think often because of this pressure, what teachers do is just focus on mistakes. And if you only focus on mistakes, students then become worried because they think the teacher's only listening to me to find mistakes and then punish my mistakes. Next time I'll talk less. So if you cheat by predicting things that you think students are going to say and keeping them kind of up your sleeve to use as part of your feedback, that can help you go over grammar you've already studied, go over vocabulary you've already studied. It can help you look at new uses of words you've already studied before. It can help you look at more complex ways of saying things. You might also think, I reckon my students are going to make these two mistakes because these are classic first language to second language mistakes connected to this topic. So I'm going to write a couple of examples and have those to focus on, even if I don't hear anybody doing that. So when you're cheating, basically, you use some of the things you think students are going to say as part of your feedback. And I'll show you an example in a minute. And I think it's fine to do this because sometimes some of the language that you look at may actually have been a problem for some students. Sometimes when I'm doing it, I say, yeah, so I heard somebody trying to say blah, blah, blah. I didn't really hear anybody, okay? I'm just bringing this because I think it's useful. And sometimes what happens is a student says, oh yeah, that was me. <laughs> Seriously, I, I didn't actually hear you say this, but if you try to say this and this is, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, it was you, thank you. Whew. Makes it look more real. I think also having something to look at as part of the feedback, it encourages participation. It reinforces the value of speaking in class. It makes students feel if I speak in class, the teacher will give me useful feedback that helps me do things better. It gives you the chance to write things in real time while the students are in the breakout room. And if you know that you already have some language to look at as part of your feedback, maybe you're less stressed and you can relax a little bit and you can actually listen better and work from what the students are really saying a little bit better. You might also want to think about correcting mistakes, okay? And 
I guess for me, the way I think about correction has changed over the years. I used to believe that correction was important because it would stop students making mistakes. <laughs> I stopped believing that because, you know, the number of times you correct a student and then they keep making the same mistake, you realize this isn't because you don't understand the rule. This isn't because I haven't corrected you. This is because your brain is not ready to change yet. And maybe you've also had this own experience with your own children. You know, I mean, for me, my son, when my son was about four or five and kind of starting to speak a lot, he used to make this weird mistake with the past symbol. So instead of saying, we went there, we saw that, he would say things like, look, daddy, the zoo, we did go there, we did see the lions. And because I'm a teacher, I would kind of go, yeah, we went there last week. I know we saw the lions and my son would look confused and say, I did say that. So no, you didn't did say that. What you did say, what you said, well, oh God, what you said was it's wrong. OK, you said we did go there. I said we went there. And my son would just look at me a bit angry and upset and say, OK, daddy. And this went on for like a year, OK, of my son saying we did go there. We did do that. We did see that. And me saying, yeah, we went there. We saw that. We did that. After about a year, my son suddenly started saying we did went there. We did saw that. We did did that. It was like, uh, so something's changing. And like six months after this, he finally started saying, we went there, we saw that, we did that. It was like, oh, hallelujah. That took a year and a half of hearing English every day for his brain to finally change. So I think, you know, if you really want to correct mistakes, enjoy yourself, do it. It won't stop those mistakes happening again. I think maybe what's better is intervening and correcting when there's a problem with communication. Because I think often you learn best when you're not communicating properly and someone helps you and you kind of go, ah, oh, that's why you don't understand me because I'm saying this and I should say this. Ugh. So it means kind of rethinking, why are you correcting them? And I think it should really be when you're doing on the spot correction, it's when communication is difficult. So maybe if a student says one minute and they reach for the dictionary, you can say to them in your first language, what are you trying to say? Oh yeah, that's blah, 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 blah in English, okay? Maybe when students say to a classmate, how do you say da, da, da in English? Then you can say, ah, I can help you here. If they use first language to do the task, you can say, oh yeah, great story. Do you know how to say that in English? No, it's this. If someone looks confused when someone else is talking, you know, I'm telling a story and the students kind of, you don't understand what I'm talking about, do you? Okay, let me explain it in another way and teach you the thing I'm trying to say here. So in those moments where there's a breakdown, those are good teaching opportunities. Often, if a student says, oh, I've been there three years ago, yeah, it's a mistake, but it's not a mistake that causes any problems or any misunderstandings. Maybe after they finish speaking, you might just have it on the board. I dot, 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 dot there three years ago. Missing word. Good. I went there. Why? Three years ago. Good. Not I've been there. Maybe kind of delayed correction is fine. Personally, nowadays, I wouldn't bother correcting that on the spot because it's not causing problems. I would correct on the spot things that cause problems and communication breakdowns. So I think the other thing we then need to think about is even when we're giving feedback and we're providing new language for students, we still need to make sure they understand the new language. We need to make sure they hear and see the new language. We need to help them pronounce the new language in some kind of way. 
and maybe give them a chance to use some of that new language, okay? So I'll show you an example in a minute of what I'm talking about. But I think when you're providing feedback, basically what you have on the board, you need to think about this as a kind of vocabulary exercise or a kind of grammar exercise. And when you stop the students and say, okay, I'm going to bring you back to the main room. I'm gonna close the breakout rooms. Okay, welcome back everybody. Sorry to stop you. I know some of you were telling great stories. Let's look at how to say some of the things you were trying to say better. As you're then doing that, maybe you're sharing your online whiteboard or your Word document or whatever you use to put new language up during class. Personally, I just use Word documents and I screen share, but you might use something different. As I'm then going through the language, sometimes I'm explaining, I'm paraphrasing, I'm making sure they understand. Maybe you might give translations for some things. You might also give extra examples. You might draw students' attention to groups of words which go together or little patterns. You might ask extra questions about some of the vocabulary, some of the grammar. You might get ideas from the students for what might they say next? What other ways could they end this question? Which other words could go here? Maybe you might then get students to do the same task again with a different partner. Okay, I'm gonna change you around. I'm gonna get you to do the same task you just did. Yeah, I know you've done it, but badly. This time, do it better using some of the new language we just looked at. And I'm only going to give you four minutes, not five, because you're better than you were five minutes ago. Let's go, let's try, okay? So I'll, I'll show you some examples, okay? This is something that I ended up with on the board recently. Um, my students were basically just chatting. Uh, this was a kind of 10 minute warmer. Um, it's a group I teach once a week for one hour and they're all in different cities and different countries. And the first 10 minutes we just do, going to put you in breakout rooms. How are you? What's going on where you are? What have you been up to since last week? And I listen and I write things down. Sometimes I also feed in things I didn't hear them trying to say, but I think they could have said or they should have said or that they don't know how to say and so I'm just going to give it to them. So we have things like, you know, so number one, I gapped off. So I'm in work at the moment. I'm a bit ill. I had to go to the doctors to get an official S dot 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 N dot dot dot. So yeah, I heard uh, Olga, you were saying you're not at work at the moment. So preposition, I'm off work at the moment. Good, because <coughs> it's not COVID, don't worry, but I'm a bit ill, but my boss is very demanding. So I had to go to the doctor to get a letter from the doctor showing I'm really ill, get an official, not sick notification, a sick note, good, okay. Any other reasons why maybe you're off work at the moment? Yeah, so it could be your kids are sick, so you have to stay at home and look after your children, that's one reason. Any other reason why you're off work at the moment? Yeah, maybe you're moving house and you need two days to organize everything. Okay, next one. I finally, I think I gapped set up. I finally dot, dot, dot up, opened up my own language studio. Missing word, set up, good. So you can set up your own language studio. Anything else you can set up? Set up your own company, set up a website, good. Congratulations, that's very brave of you. Yeah, when people tell you this, usually they mean, are you mad? But they say, very brave, very brave decision. Bad person. It's not an easy time to start up on your own. Any other time you might say, that's very brave of you, okay? And we just went on like this. So eliciting some words, asking extra questions. My house looks out over a forest. Oh, that sounds lovely. Anything else your house might look out over? Yeah, maybe your house looks out 
over the mountains or your house looks out over the sea. Lucky you. Where do you live? Anything else? Yeah, my house looks out over lots of other houses that look like my house. Well, <laughs> join the club. Welcome to my world. My house looks out over a building site. My house looks out over a supermarket car park. OK, I really miss being near a forest. Anything else you might really miss at the moment? I miss seeing people, real people, three dimensional people, not just people in Zoom. So it's kind of using this language, asking students questions, eliciting some things, sometimes asking them, you know, what tense is it here? Present perfect. Why? From the past to now. Good. Just checking. OK, you can break the one hour barrier. Anything else you can break? You can break your record. OK, yeah, you can break the world record. You can also break your leg. Maybe you break your leg trying to break the world record. OK, yeah. So you can kind of work with this language and ask students this. So I'm going to stop. I think we've got eight or nine minutes left. I wanted to see if there were any questions. I'll send the PowerPoint later along to Meta for Meta to share with everybody. But please do check out our website, lexicallab.com. Um, if you're on Facebook, find us, follow us. And if anyone wants to get in touch or wants to ask questions you're too shy to ask now, or wants any further thoughts or advice, feel free to email me. It's Hugh at lexicallab.com. I think what I'd like to do for the last sort of five, 10 minutes, I'm gonna do something very quickly. Uh, I'm going to put you in breakout rooms for a couple of minutes, okay? From what you've heard me talking about, how much of that do you do already? What do you think you could do more of, you'd like to start doing more of? Any questions or anything you're still not sure of, okay? So what do you do already? What would you like to do more of? Any questions? So give you a couple of minutes in breakout rooms and then we'll come back and we'll see what comes up. There you go. Go to your rooms. It's like talking to teenagers. Get into your room now. Yes, please press on on join button. Yeah. To go to the room. Don't forget that you can find it. For those who are um, viewing from the phone, there is this bar that you can like, or the pop up window. Of course, it depends on. I'll pop in and listen. Okay. Okay. I'll be watching people here to yeah, join. Thanks. Okay, Alicia, Marcella, do you have any problems with joining the rooms? Got lots of other exciting things to, to see and do today. I just wondered if anyone had any questions or anything you wanted any extra thoughts on. Tell me. I can ask one question. Yeah, tell me. Hey. Like, when you said about uh, teaching something new based on students speaking, yeah. how do you know that that would be new? Or how do you elicit that new information? Like what to focus on? when they Because are I can hear them not being able to say something. OK, so I might hear students say something like, so I'm um, let, let me give you an example, okay? A high level example. Uh, I was doing a class yesterday and one of my students was talking about some news where she lives and she was saying, yeah, so this guy, he was fired from his job because he made racist comments at work and how to say, um, today, today, like not today, but generally 
today, such comments are not okay in my country. Such comments are unacceptable in my country. And so I listened to this and I thought, I know what you're trying to say. Um, and what I ended up teaching at the end was, and this is, a, you know, this is like proficiency level, okay? But it's the same principle. So at the end, I said, you know, um, he made some terrible racist comments. And in this day and age, you can't say things like that, okay? And so I then just gave an extra example of, you know, in this day and age, it's shocking things like this still happens. It basically means today, but you use it when you're talking about things you're surprised about or shocked or depressed about that still happen. And I then just, you know, gave one or two extra examples. A lower level example might be something like I'm teaching pre-intermediate students and one of my students, they're doing a role play and they're, they're just practicing. What are you doing this weekend? Okay. And one of them says, oh, tonight I, I, I will... I will to meet my girlfriend is very important. No late, because if late, oh, okay. So what I then end up teaching is, what are you doing this weekend? Tonight, I, not I will to meet, I'm meeting my girlfriend. Good, okay. What tense is it? Present continuous. Why? Arrangement in the future. Yeah, I'm meeting my girlfriend. Yeah, I can't be late. If I'm late, she, yeah, how to say this in English, she'll kill me, okay? So with the higher level group, it's often just chunks and phrases and idioms and things that they don't quite know how to say. With the lower level groups, it's kind of grammar and vocabulary together that they don't know how to say. So I'm just listening for those kind of gaps or those problems and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, okay, I know what you're looking for here. And I'm then writing that down and coming back to that as part of my feedback. Yeah, does that answer the question? Was it Irina, yes. was it? Yeah. Yes, yes, hey. thank you. Hugh. Yeah. Yes, Hugh, may I hey. ask you a question? Of course you can, Larissa. Yeah, uh, thank you. So um, I am just curious, have you ever planned a lesson and end up teaching uh, something totally different? Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 sometimes. And I'm much less worried about that than I used to be, okay? Because okay. when I was doing my initial training, like CELTAs and DELTAs and that kind of thing, there's this real pressure on you to meet your lesson aims, to do everything that you've planned to do. You know, this is only supposed to take three minutes, that has to take seven minutes. And if something started going off like this, I would panic thinking, no, no, come back. Lesson has to go this way. Now what happens is even with like really good groups, you give them a task, you put them in a breakout room. You think they're all going to be talking about, do you know anyone who's pregnant at the moment or anyone who has any children? You go in one room and they're talking about this terrible crash that happened with the basketball players from Volgograd. You go in another room and they're talking about the weather in Kiev. And I used to think, oh my God, they're not doing the task. Now I think, interesting, okay. <laughs> Who knew this is what they were gonna be talking about? Is there some new language connected to what they're talking about that I can teach? So what I then end up doing is to say, okay, let's have a look at the language. I heard some interesting conversations. Some of them were actually about the task. <laughs> Some of them were completely different. Some of you were talking about this crash in, in Volgograd where these five basketball players were killed. Let's have a look at how to tell that story better. Some of you were complaining about the weather in Kiev, yeah? You said, lots of wind. Yeah, it's blowing a gale at the moment. And it's pouring down. It's bucketing down. So I'll just teach something I wasn't expecting to teach because the conversation's gone somewhere else and that's a good problem I think you know I mean if that happens to you be happy because your students want to talk about something you know and just teach something new connected to what they're trying to say and it keeps you on your toes rather than trying to pull the conversation back for me I'm like okay you want to go there we'll go there I'll teach you something afterwards to help you go there better next time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome.
Did anyone else have maybe one more question you wanted to ask? Somebody asked here, yes, uh, how do we assess the speaking? This is a very... So yes. that's a really big question. My answer to that would be, it depends on why you need to assess it, okay? Um, if you're working in the state system and you're forced to assess it, um, well, you'll probably have criteria that you assess it on and you will follow those guidelines and say, well, that speaking was a four and I'm only giving you a four because you did this, but you didn't do that and make the criteria known to the students. If you're not forced to assess it, my advice would be don't assess it. OK, um, I guess, you know, a lot of what I'm doing is kind of indirect assessment because I'm listening and looking for how what the students are saying can be done better and feeding in ways of helping them say things better. Um, but what I'm not doing is saying, you know, that was a seven because and generally these days I only do that if I'm teaching an exam class and we're doing speaking specifically practicing the speaking for the exam then I will assess it using the criteria that the exam tells me they're going to be assessed on so I guess it depends you know if there's a reason why you're assessing it assess it according to the criteria that you're supposed to assess it for if not then the criteria is how can I help you get better at doing what you're doing? You know, that simple. Okay, I'm guessing I should probably finish because I know you guys have lots of other things going on today. Um, if you do think of other questions or other things you want thoughts on, please email me. I'm always happy to hear from people and keep in touch. And I hope to see you, to see one you day soon. back in Moldova. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, take it's care. See you everyone. face to face, not all Yeah, day. I hope so too. One day, one day. It's take it one easy, day everyone, soon. Yeah? Let's point. Yes, Thank you. soon. Thank you very much, Hugh. You're welcome. Great take to care. See you. Yeah, you too. See you. Bye bye.